Pius, uh, I want to I want to Hi, from RBK Pediatrics. Um, I'm here tonight uh, to have one of my students that grounded at RBK for this month, uh, Kwasim Chowdhury. He's a third year medical student at uh, NYIT here on Long Island. You may have seen him around in our office. Um, he's preparing for you a nice little uh, presentation on adolescent uh, vaccinations and why it's important to give it to our adolescent students. So, um, Dr. Kwasim, please take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Rogu. So, as you said, today I want to talk about adolescent vaccines and the important ones that you want to get and why they're valuable and which diseases they protect against. So, let's jump straight into it. So, today we're going to be talking about five major vaccines. We're going to be talking about the Tdap vaccine, Menactra, HPV, influenza, and most recently the COVID-19 vaccine. And so we're going to be going through each of these one by one and explaining the, which disease they prevent against and why it is important to prevent against this disease. And so we're going to start off with Tdap. So the Tdap vaccine is a combo vaccine. It's given to prevent against tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. And so you see it's an acronym. The T is for tetanus, D is for diphtheria, and P is for pertussis. And so we're going to go through each of these diseases to see, exa see what exactly we're defending ourselves against by giving the Tdap vaccine. And thus, we're going to start with tetanus. And so tetanus is a severe bacterial infection that you get with deep wounds. And so the most classic example of a wound giving uh, tetanus is stepping on a rusty nail. We've all heard of uh, rusty nails giving tetanus. And Tetanus is characterized with severe muscle spasms. Typically, you see muscle tightening, most classically the locked jaw where you have trouble speaking, and paralysis of the respiratory muscles where you're having trouble breathing because you're having severe spasms in your intercostals. And so this can lead to respiratory failure and ultimately be fatal in young children because they'll have trouble just breathing normally. And so and that's the T in heat up and so moving forward with the D, D is for diphtheria. Diphtheria is also a severe bacterial infection which is spread with respiratory droplets so when you cough and sneeze that's how it's transmitted. And like tetanus this also causes severe respiratory distress, heart failure, and paralysis may result. Diphtheria is a is a infection that targets important organ systems such as the heart, the nerves, and the kidney and so Long-term complications can include myocarditis, polyneuropathies, paralysis. You want to defend against all of these, and diphtheria, uh, Tdap helps uh, do that for diphtheria. And then we're moving on to the P and Tdap. P is for pertussis, and so the most classic sign, the most classic sign of pertussis is a deep whooping cough. And so, just like the other two, pertussis is a severe bacterial infection caused by Bordetella pertussis and it's spread via respiratory droplets, just like diphtheria is. And so this whooping cough that you start with in pertussis can develop into vomiting and even choking on your own vomit. And this can cause pneumonia, apnea when sleeping, and encephalopathies. And so this could potentially be fatal in young children because young children have underdeveloped lungs and respiratory systems. And so if they're coughing incessantly, then that can cause respiratory distress, and they might, not, they might not be able to overcome that the same way an older individual might be able to. So it's very important to vaccinate against pertussis so we don't have to have our children go through that. And in regards to the vaccine, the vaccine should be given between the ages of 11 and 12. And after the initial dose, a Tdap booster should then be administered every 10 years. So 21, 31, 41, every 10 years, just get your Tdap booster to keep yourself safe against all of these uh, diseases that we mentioned. And the Tdap vaccine uh, continues to be safe for people of all ages, and this includes pregnant women and their babies. So just be uh, aware that the Tdap, the Tdap vaccine is clinically proven to be, it's clinically proven to be safe, and you can take it throughout your life regardless of what age you are. And so that wraps things up with Tdap. And so we're going to move on to Menactra and Vexera. And so the Menactra vaccine is administered to prevent against men meningococcal disease. And so 
with meningococcal disease, as you might see with the child on the right-hand side, he's missing both of his hands and both of his legs. This is this can potentially be a long-term complication of meningococcal disease. Meningococcal disease is a particularly uh, it's a particularly uh, fatal disease that even if you treat, we have the means to treat meningococcal disease, but even if you treat the patient, they might not make a full recovery. Even with antibiotic treatment of meningococcal disease, 10 to 15% of people don't make it through. And of the people who do make it through, 20% of survivors live with long-term disability, such as amputations, deafness, uh, nervous system problems and brain damage. And so it's not a disease that you can cleanly survive from. There's going to be, there's potentially going to be long-term consequences that you're going to have to live with. And so it's very important to get vaccinated in the first place. So we don't even need to treat it to begin with. Prevention is the best medicine for this specific disease. And so meningococcal disease is caused by an Aceria meningitis and it's spread via respiratory droplets, such as throat secretions, coughing, that sort of thing. And it causes a wide range of diseases, which are infections of the brain, the blood, and the spinal cord. And so, as we mentioned before, these infections can have long-term complications, and it's generally a it's a it's a big undertaking to treat and ultimately recover from. So it's not something that we want to get in the first place. And so, in regards to um, an actor vaccine, it should be given between the ages of 11 and 12, just like the Tdap vaccine. But unlike the Tdap vaccine, the Minactra vaccine only has one booster, and that's given five years later at the age of 16. And the Minactra vaccine is safe, the most common side effect being mild soreness at the spot of injection, but that's typical for any vaccine. And so the Minactra vaccine has no serious side effects or complications that you can expect. And it's used to guard against a very deadly disease that used to be very common before we vaccinated against it. And so... Moving on to Bexero. Bexero is a different type of vaccine from Menactra because it protects against a different strain of meningitis. And so with Bexero, we usually want to give Bexero to kids who are leaving high school and they're going to go off to college or the military or whatever post high school career they want to pursue. And so both doses of Bexero can be given in the span of a month. So it's very easy to get before you head out to wherever you need to go. And the primary target for the Bexero vaccine are people who are between the ages of 16 and 18. So usually around that young adult age, right, when you're going to choose your career path or go off and leave your home, it's good to get the Bexero vaccine before you go and do these things. And that wraps things up for uh, Menactra. So Tdap Menactra, we're moving on to HPV now. And so the HPV vaccine is administered to prevent against human papillomavirus or uh, HPV. And so HPV is a common virus that's spread via sexual contact. And we have two categories of symptoms with HPV. We have mild symptoms, which are characterized by warts on our genitals, anus, mouth, throat. And then we have more severe symptoms, which can be cancerous potentially. And that can include cervical, anal, vulvar, vaginal, penile. And <clears throat> generally, when you get HPV infections, usually they are self-limiting and you typically experience more mild symptoms, but there are certain strains of HPV which are more deadly and more dangerous, and they're more likely to develop into cancer. And so the purpose of the HPV vaccine is to guard against these more dangerous strains that can lead to more dangerous symptoms. And so the HPV vaccine is given to guard against these mo more dangerous strains, the strains that can cause cancer, the strands that don't resolve uh, quickly, the ones that persist onwards, that's what we're trying to protect with the HPV vaccine. And so the HPV vaccine is recommended to, you're recommended to get vaccinated between the ages of nine through 14. If you do get vaccinated in that age range between nine and 14, you only require two shots. If you wait longer, like above the age of 15, then you will require three shots to be fully vaccinated. And then moving onward above the age of 26, you might have to confide in your doctor to see if it's safe to get uh, vaccinated for HPV. And so it's just better to get vaccinated earlier in life against HPV because the longer you wait, the less tolerant you may be with uh, the vaccine. And so it's very safe for children. It's very safe for people under the age of 26. And then above the age of 26, you might have to see 
Eora, PCP, to see if the HPV vaccine can be given safely, but it generally can be. And so of all the preventative measures, the HPV vaccine provides the most protection against the virus. A, co um, a common strategy that a lot of people might do is they might think that uh, regular protection, such as condoms, latex, other typical sexual protection might guard against the virus. And it potentially could, but it's very unreliable and you're really just rolling a dice. So of all the preventative measures, it's best to just get vaccinated with the HPV vaccine because that's a sure that's a surefire thing that'll give you the thumbs up to start becoming sexually active. And so as a part of good sexual hygiene, it is recommended to get vaccinated before you uh, start uh, becoming sexually active. And there have been no long-term complications with the vaccine. And the only pertinent note about HPV is that pregnant women should not receive the HPV vaccine. And so although it's recommended that pregnant women not get vaccinated, there have been no adverse effects in women who have received the vaccine before they knew that they were pregnant. We haven't seen any complications in these women. And so although it's recommended against getting vaccinated while you're pregnant, there haven't been any observed complications. So it's, it's a very clinically trialed and safe vaccine that you can rely on to give you protection against the human papillomavirus. And so moving forward, we're gonna talk about flu for a little bit. Now, of all the vaccines in this presentation, we're all probably most familiar with the flu vaccine since we get it every year. So the flu vaccine, as we all know, is transmitted through respiratory droplets. And so coughing, sneezing, you're familiar with that. And with influenza, at the lighter side, we might see typical cold symptoms that'll resolve on their own. On the more severe side, we could see pneumonia, myocarditis, more severe flu symptoms. And so it's recommended to get a flu vaccine every year to prevent against the strain for that season. And as mentioned before, typical side effects with any infection or any vaccine are mild muscle aches and soreness at the spot of the injection. And so you can start getting the flu vaccine as early as six months of age, and then you can just get it every year to keep yourself safe against influenza. And then moving forward, we're going to talk about COVID-19. And so we're going to spend a bit more time talking about COVID-19 than all of the aforementioned vaccines, because it is the most recent one and the one that is most relevant in today's uh, climate, and also the one that people have the most questions about because of that. And so we're going to break it down uh, step by step. So starting with COVID-19, COVID-19 is a virus that includes a wide range of symptoms. We might see typical cold symptoms. We might see loss of taste and smell. We might see shortness of breath. Symptoms can range from mild to severe in any of these categories. And so generally in younger people, we might see more mild symptoms. The groups of people that we're most interested in protecting are the elderly, which includes people who are over 65 years of age, people with organ diseases, people with heart problems, lung problems, liver problems, they might not tolerate the vaccine or the virus that well. They might experience, experience more severe clinical symptoms. People who are obese and people who are immunocompromised. These groups of people are at most risk of developing more severe clinical symptoms than other people. And so we have to keep in mind throughout this presentation that even if we ourselves do not fall into any of these four categories, we might have loved ones or friends or family or people at work who do. And by getting vaccinated, not only are we protecting ourselves, we're also protecting those around us from contracting the virus from us potentially if we do happen to get it. And so in regards to the safety of the COVID vaccine, there's a lot of talk about how the development of the vaccine and how it was rushed and it not being tested. Like these are all myths that aren't they're, they're not substantiated because when we talk about the CDC and approving vaccines, each vaccine that the CDC approves are put through three phases of clinical trials. And the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine was no different. It was put through all three of these trials. And after being put through all three phases of clinical trials, there were no safety concerns after eight weeks for any of the participants in the trials. And the reason this is important is because eight weeks is a milestone for uh, vaccine safety. Generally, when we give vaccines and there's no 
complications after the eight week mark, we can consider, we can deem that vaccine to be safe because any sorts of pro problems that arise after eight weeks is most likely not connected to the vaccination you got. And so the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine was put through all the clinical trials. And the reason it was relatively quick is because the there's currently a pandemic going on where there's a lot of people who are affected by the COVID-19 uh, virus. And so clinical trials were able to be performed in a more timely manner because there's such a large population of people to draw from. There's more people who are infected with COVID-19 and thus it's easier to conduct these trials to gauge the efficacy of the virus. And so that's why the COVID-19 clinical trials were completed in and presumably faster than other vaccines in the past. But this is not because any safety precautions or guidelines were ignored or skipped over. The vaccine was not expedited in any way. None of the phases were skipped. It's just the sheer volume of people affected helped uh, facilitate the approval and the development of the vaccine. And so even now, the CDC and the FDA are continuing to monitor the vaccine side effects. It's not like a one and done where they throw it out and they just sort of let people take it and they don't watch what's going on. They're still even now observing and documenting side effects and they'll alert the public if any adverse effects are observed. And so doctors are obligated to report any adverse effects that patients have after taking the vaccine, even if these, uh, even if these adverse effects aren't directly related to the vaccine, they're still obligated to report them. And so the the uh, rates of complications reported for the vaccine are most likely overreported because you have to report every single thing that happens after the vaccine, whether the vaccine caused it or not. So they're keeping a very close eye on what happens after you take the vaccine in the general public. And so if we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine side effects, it has typical side effects that are expected with any injection. So you might have pain, redness, and swelling at the site of injection. And you may also experience short-lived fevers, chills, headaches, body aches. And in the case that you experience it, <clears throat> in the case that you experience any of these, you can take a Tylenol or a Motrin or a Leave, your preferred NSAID to sort of get over the fever. It'll be resolved the next day. It's not going to linger and you're not going to have to worry about it after that. And so why do we want to get vaccinated? What's the value in vaccination? So all approved and authorized COVID-19 vaccines, this includes Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, they're highly effective at protecting against death or hospitalization for the coronavirus. And so although the vaccine isn't a 100% barrier against the virus, it still has value in that fully vaccinated individuals are associated with less severe clinical symptoms and reduced transmissibility. And so as we mentioned before, there are certain groups of people that we want to protect against the virus, this being the elderly, those with organ diseases, people who are obese, and people who are immunocompromised. These groups of individuals are the ones who are most vulnerable from experiencing severe clinical symptoms. And so by getting the COVID-19 vaccine, we can not only protect ourselves by having the clinical symptoms be less severe, we can protect those around us by reducing our ability to transmit the virus. And so it's valuable not only in promoting our own health, but in promoting the health of those around us. We don't want to be a danger to our mom or our dad or our coworkers or children at school. In general, generally, there's no, there's no downside to getting the vaccine. There's only positives that you can get. And so the COVID-19 vaccine is currently recommended for everyone 12 and older to get vaccinated. And everyone 12 and older should get vaccinated, whether or not you are at risk there, there are people that you can protect by getting vaccinated, and that's the value of the COVID-19 vaccine, is to protect yourself and those around you. And that wraps things up for this presentation. And so just to look over what we talked about today, we talked about the Tdap vaccine and its value in protecting against tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. We talked about the Menaxa vaccine, which is used for protecting against meningococcal disease, along with the Bexero vaccine which is given later in life. We have the HPV vaccine, which is used to protect against sexually transmitted diseases. We have influenza, we all know influenza, it's the yearly flu shots we get. And finally, the COVID vaccine, which is the most recent vaccine in 
one of the more urgent vaccines to get because of the current pandemic and the current outbreak of cases. So I hope that this presentation has been useful in informing your decision on whether or not you want to be vaccinated. I highly recommend it to get vaccinated, both you and your children, to get vaccinated for all these diseases because it is important not only in protecting yourselves, but also those around you, your loved ones, people at work. That's just it's just healthy safety etiquette to get vaccinated. And if you have any questions, you can talk to your local healthcare provider, your PCP, and ask them any questions to give you more information on vaccinations. I'm sure they'll be happy to help you. And so in conclusion, get vaccinated. It's important to get these vaccines as a part of general growth and keeping safe in our current climate. And so I'm gonna throw it back to Dr. Rogu to sort of close us out. Well, Kwasim, that was an excellent presentation. I'm sure a lot of our parents and families and teenagers are going to gather a lot of information. You've answered a lot of the questions that I often hear in the examination room about the different types of vaccines. So um, I thank you once again for this uh, excellent presentation. We'll share it with our families. And I want to thank you for spending time at RBK Pediatrics. I am certain that you learned something with us. And who knows, maybe one day you'll become a pediatrician. We never Thanks know. so much, Dr. Roger. Okay. Have a good night. You as well.